Well, friends, I'm so thrilled you chose to join us in this hour of worship as we start a new year together. We're starting a brand new sermon series and working through in this month of January and February, getting into shape. We've got a phenomenal preaching team, and I'm so excited to have them join me as we collectively grow in our ability through the power of the Holy Spirit and God's heart for us to be people used for God's purposes. So as we spend time in prayer and in worship, as we go to God's word, know that I've got a special invitation for you at the end of our time together. May God bless you in the hour ahead.
All right, friends, as we continue the sermon series, a reminder that we're in a brand new year and with new years often come new starts and new beginnings. And we've been talking about in this Fresh Start sermon series that so many people during this time of year with New Year's resolutions want to get into shape. And that's not just physical shape, but a lot of people it's financial shape relationship shape, uh, all the ways in which we can get more healthy in our lives. And in this season, we want to get into spiritual shape, not just as individuals, but collectively as a community of faith, as the body of Christ. In fact, God wants to do a really remarkable and miraculous thing through us as a church family. And the more that we enliven our heart and our mind to that vision for our lives, the more God's going to grow us in a variety of ways. And in fact, in this sermon series, we've been taking a look at an acronym. This acronym of SHAPE was first coined by 
two pastors at Saddleback Church. Many of you are familiar with Rick Warren, you know, the founder of Saddleback Church. But there's another pastor uh, who some people don't know the name of this individual. And I, I constantly forget his name, uh, but his name is Eric Reese. And it's important to remind ourselves that these two gentlemen, God gave them a vision for this SHAPE acronym that has to do with spiritual gifts, our heart, abilities, personality, and experiences. And so we have taken inspiration from this uh, SHAPE acronym. And in this season of wanting to get in shape as a church, we're contextualizing it for us here at Bel Air Church. And today we get to the A in SHAPE. And a reminder, if you've missed any of these, you can get caught up afterwards on our YouTube channel. You can simply search for Bel Air Church on YouTube and look for SHAPE. And on the A today, we're talking about abilities. Now, on one hand, this is very distinct from, yet connected to, spiritual gifts. If spiritual gifts are God-given for God's purposes to do things that only God can do through us, abilities actually have to do with your uniqueness. Not only in how God wired you, but actually in the unique circumstances and environments of your life. And in the sovereignty of God, that God has allowed you to be born at this particular point in human history, in a particular area, to a particular family of origin, to be given uh, certain access to education and relationships and resources. All of these things have shaped you very, very uniquely. And those have shaped you uniquely all the way going back to, as it says in Psalm 139, where it says uh, that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. You've been shaped by God, as it says in Scripture. You've been knit together in your mother's womb. And yet we are not, you know, wound up like toys and then set out into this world. But ultimately, this life that we've been given as a gift is this constantly complex shaping of who we are. In fact, you are the sum product today of all the, the experiences, the access, the resources, I mean, a multitude, a complexity of things that have brought you to who you are today. But who you are today isn't necessarily who you're gonna be a year from now because you'll have new experiences, new insights, new relationships, new opportunities that are gonna shape who you are and ultimately they shape your abilities. And I want to talk today as we go to God's Word about the importance of connecting your abilities to God's purposes in the world. And in fact, as we get into this, a reminder that uh, our abilities, no matter what they are, make us unique. And yet at the same time, I, I meet so many people who, for whatever reason, they say, I don't have much to give. I don't have many abilities. I mean, I, I look at so-and-so, I look at her, I look at them, and man, they are so talented. They're so gifted. They're so able. But who am I? And so many people, they, they come into my office, they send emails, and they say, I've got no abilities. The first point I want to make is this, that you have abilities. In fact, there's certain studies that have been done that actually say that every human being has upwards of 700 unique abilities. The problem is, is you don't see them in your everyday life. You know, if you spend time with other people, whether it's through work or with family, if you're in a relationship, you, you begin to discover the diversity of abilities that people have. I mean, think of it this way. There's some people who have the ability to solve problems. Others uniquely have the ability to sit with a problem. Both of those take great skill. Some people have the ability to start things. Others have the ability to finish things. Some people have the ability to move fast. Some people have the ability to move slow. Some people have the ability to lack patience and have a sense of urgency and of conviction. And some people have this great ability to, to be patient, to have that long obedience in the same direction. And the uniqueness of our abil abilities, on one hand, you could say, is kind of neutral. I mean, the sheer fact that, that certain people have abilities uh, just is. 
The key is, is what do we do with those abilities? The second point I want to make is that when we take our abilities and we actually, we put them into God's hands, miraculous and wonderful things can happen. The passage I want to go to, if you have your Bibles, is actually in the gospel according to Matthew. And I know that we're going to get to a very famous scene, a scene in which Jesus sees a need and meets that need and meets the need through a very unlikely offering to him. This is found in Matthew chapter 14, and it says uh, in verse 13, uh, Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place. And the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, we have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds and all ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, 12 baskets full. And those who ate were about 5,000 men. And that didn't even include the women and the children. This, my friends, the reading of God's word, as we say every week, thanks be to God. You know, this Matthew passage is often the most frequent one of the gospel accounts of the feeding of the 5,000. I wonder if it's because Matthew falls, uh, you know, in the Bible uh, before Mark and Luke and John. You know, the four gospel accounts, these four unique eyewitness accounts of God through the power of the Holy Spirit, giving these authors the ability to write about the, the remarkable ministry in the life of Jesus Christ. It's kind of like uh, four newspapers, four different sets of reporters reporting on the same unique historical event and that together there gets to be this, this greater vision, a wonderful tapestry, a, a fuller picture of something that happened. And so when we look at Matthew and we look, look at Mark and we look at uh, Luke and we look at John, it gives us a richer, a deeper sense of who Jesus is. And in this Matthew passage, it says that the, the disciples are the ones who offer up these loaves of bread and these fish. But in the Luke account, it gives even more detail. You know, Luke is the physician, writes in more detail than any of the other gospel writers. Mark is the, the shortest. It's kind of like the, uh, the action film writer, you know, just punchy right to the point. It's all about signs and wonders and the action of Jesus. And, and Matthew really unpacks and details Jesus as the Messiah fulfilling uh, the Abrahamic covenant and the history of Israel. And, and John is just filled with just miraculous and supernatural and profound imagery, richness. And Luke gives so much detail. And in Luke's account on the feeding of the 5,000, it's actually a child that comes forward and gives to the disciples the loaves and the fish. Now in first century culture, children didn't mean much. In fact, we see a little bit of evidence of this in the Matthew account. At the very end of this text, it says, again in verse 21, and those who ate were about 5,000, not including the women and children. Often, when they would count crowds in the first century, they would count the men. They wouldn't count women and they wouldn't count children. It was a historical, patriarchal view of the world that is being reflected here in the reality of this account. We know for a fact that Jesus reflecting the heart of God lifts up women much differently and unlike the first century and frankly how much of the world does today, lifts them up, gives them a place of prominence, of honor. In fact, God through the power of the Holy Spirit and through Jesus, doesn't just call men to follow Jesus, that there was actually women disciples as well. 
In fact, there were women planters of the early church. When you look at uh, uh, Priscilla, uh, when you look at many others who, Lydia, for example, remarkable, remarkable women who were powerful leaders in the early church that God used. And in fact, children would come to Jesus and he didn't brush them off even though the disciples were trying to keep the children away. No, Jesus says, no, come, come. And he used it to make a point. Unless you come like a child, you will never inherit the kingdom of God. And so in the Luke account of all people, it's not a man, it's a child who comes forward and brings this offering. And what a great reminder. I need this reminder and I believe you need this reminder that no matter who you are, no matter what the world says about you, no matter what your position is on this planet, no matter what job title you have, no matter how much you have in your bank account, no matter what your education level is, no matter what your zip code is, no matter what your relationship status is, no matter what people have said to you or not said about you, it doesn't matter. Regardless, there's you. And you are fearfully and wonderfully made. There's no one on the planet like you. And I wonder what would have happened had that child who remains nameless in scripture hadn't come forward and simply just gave what they had. We don't know because they did come forward even though they were a child. In the first century where children were overlooked, they came forward to the disciples who knows how intimidating that was? I don't know this kid's personality, but we know that this kid came forward and simply gave what they had, which was actually in comparison to the great need. It was nothing compared to what was out there in terms of the hunger of thousands and thousands and thousands of people. And yet this child came forward and simply offered up what they had. In the same way, you and I, we have abilities. And it is microscopic, it is minuscule compared to the needs of the world around us. And there can be this great temptation to get overwhelmed when we look on the news, to get overwhelmed when we think about the division, to get overwhelmed when we think about injustice or oppression. We can get so overwhelmed with violence and hatred. We can get so overwhelmed by all these things that we overlook the fact that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, that God is inviting us to take in our minds the little that we have and to simply put it into God's hands. The story of scripture is broken human beings ultimately being used by God to do powerful, powerful things. And when you look at the disciples, the 12 disciples that are named the apostles of Christ, they all had different abilities. Some of them were lawyers. Some of them were tax collectors. Some of them were fishermen. Some of them were zealots. Uh, some of them uh, uh, just spoke their mind without really thinking. Uh, some of them were very quiet. Some of them had just a, a really soft heart and thick skin. Some of them had thick hearts and soft skin. It just, it's remarkable when you look at the abilities and the uniqueness of all of these disciples. In fact, next week, I'm going to talk about our personalities. You see, our personalities are distinct from our abilities. Our abilities often are the things that we can do, uh, a skill, a capacity. Uh, our personality has a lot to do with our, our, our temperament, uh, things that are, that are harder to translate you know, onto paper, and, and such uniqueness, and, and it is this temptation also, we'll get into it next week, to think that only certain personalities can be used by God. We'll get there next week. But there's also a certain temptation to think that only certain abilities can be used by God. We might think wrongly that only people who have the ability to just, uh, you know, speak boldly in a public setting, only, only those people are going to be used by God. Well, it's not the case. In fact, there is a great profound reality that we see in Scripture that when God gets a hold of people who don't have those abilities, but different abilities, God uses those abilities in ways that perhaps God wouldn't use other people's abilities in that particular way. 
And so when you take your abilities and put them into God's hands, miraculous things can happen. Thousands can be fed, needs can be met in your community, in your life. And in the life of a church, as God is getting us collectively in shape, we need your abilities. Again, some of you are great decision makers. Some of you have the ability to simply hold all things in tension and still be at peace and to work through that. The abilities that we are looking for in this church body to not only be used by God for God's kingdom purposes in this community, but on this campus and in this city and around the world are as varied as all the abilities of all the people that call Bel Air their church home. And in fact, there's certain ministries that we don't yet have in this church because we haven't yet experienced your unique abilities. We're in a season where we are growing. We're very entrepreneurial about this. And there's certain ministry aspects that we want to launch, some officially and some that we want to bless and encourage unofficially as we grow in our ability to be the church at work. Again, we've been in this season defining church not as a building or just an hour on Sunday, but church is a community of people defined by the reality of who Jesus is. If you've said yes to Jesus, then you were part of the church. You are the church. You are the ecclesia. You are the called out ones. And you have abilities, unique abilities that God wants to use, not just in your life or in your profession or in your relationships, but in the context of this community of faith to build up one another and for the flourishing of others in this city, around this nation, and beyond. There's this great quote. Many people uh, have used it. I've seen it in books. Uh, I've seen it. Um, uh, I've, I've heard it in sermons. No one really knows where the, the origin of this list came from. But uh, let me read this. A, a great reminder that sometimes it's in our inabilities that God can work in powerful ways. Listen to this. Remember, Noah was a drunk. Abraham was too old. Isaac was a daydreamer. Jacob was a liar. Joseph was abused. Moses stuttered. Gideon was afraid. Samson had long hair and was a womanizer. Rahab was a prostitute. Jeremiah and Timothy were too young. David was an adulterer and a murderer. Elisha was suicidal. Isaiah preached naked. Jonah ran from God. Naomi was a widow. Job went bankrupt. Peter denied Christ. The disciples fell asleep while praying. Martha worried about everything. The Samaritan woman was divorced more than once. Zacchaeus was too small. Paul was too religious. Timothy had an ulcer. And Lazarus, Lazarus was dead. And yet God used each of these individuals in such powerful ways. In some ways, in spite of their abilities, but often because of their abilities. Isaiah was known as the best orator, the best communicator in all of Israel. And God used that particular ability to preach what many refer to as the fifth gospel account. You know, we've talked about Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. A lot of theologians say that Isaiah is the fifth gospel account because so much of this Old Testament book in the Hebrew Scriptures actually talks about Christ long before Jesus the Christ was born in Bethlehem. And so God used Abraham as well, and Moses, and Naomi, and Ruth in such powerful ways, Deborah and Gideon, and yet each of them had unique abilities, unique skill sets. And Paul, think about Paul. I often remark about the unique personality and the unique abilities that Paul had. In fact, there's a great, a, a phenomenal uh, biographical um, deep dive in the life of Paul. It was written by the, uh, the theologian N.T. Wright, if you want to uh, pick up this book. And, and, and it's, I think, one of the best books, contemporary books, I should say, out there that takes a look at Paul's unique abilities, Paul's unique education, Paul's unique skill sets, and how God got a hold of Paul and used him in such a powerful way to take the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ and to spread it to the ends of the earth. In fact, the Apostle Paul, he acknowledges this, 
but he realizes that ultimately there's something deeper that he longs for in his life. I want you to hear this. This is from uh, Philippians chapter 3. And the Apostle Paul kind of goes through a, a litany uh, of his abilities, of his skill sets. Uh, and he talks about, you know, confidence and how some people can put all their confidence in their abilities, their resume, their skills. And he acknowledges that, but moves even further, even deeper. Listen to this. He says, if anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, in themselves, he says, I have more. He says, let me give you a list of my abilities, my accomplishments. I was circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, and as to righteousness under the law, blameless. And again, I don't have time to dive into it right now, but N.T. Wright actually breaks down each of those things and talks about actually how that those abilities, those skills, those opportunities, those resources that Paul had in his life, God used them in a very powerful way when he got a hold of his heart. Because remember, the Apostle Paul had all these abilities, but he hadn't yet put these abilities into God's hands. He was using these abilities for religious self-righteous, legalistic, pharisaical purposes. He was persecuting the church. And with all of his abilities, all of his skill, all of his leadership capacity, he was using it to, to hurt the body of Christ. He approved the stoning of Stephen. And ultimately, Jesus meets him on the road to Damascus. This is after Jesus' life, his death, his burial, his resurrection, and his ascension. Jesus appears, knocks him off his horse. He's blinded. And there's this voice from now Jesus, the resurrected Christ saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? A great reminder that the church is the body of Christ. That you can't separate the community of faith from Christ himself. It's not that just Jesus has a church. It's that Jesus' body here on earth is the church, the body of Christ, the priesthood of all believers. And so he says, why do you persecute me? You see, when he was attacking Christians, he ultimately was attacking Jesus. He gets a hold of them. He gives them a deeper, a greater vision out of a relationship that can be formed from that moment to now use his abilities for God's purposes, not for religious purposes, to use his abilities for the spread of the gospel rather than the spread of the law. And so he's given that list. He then says in verse seven, yet whatever gains I had, past tense, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. You see, the Apostle Paul had abilities, but he didn't put all of his identity into his abilities. His abilities were part of him, but they weren't the fullness of him. And yet God used those abilities now out of the overflow of this relationship with God. He says, it's not my abilities, it's not my resume, it's not my skills that make me me. I am me in relationship with my maker. And now in relationship, God can use these abilities, can use my zeal, can use my leadership, can use my power of persuasion, can use my relational capital making now in God's hands for God's glory, for God's purposes, for the spread of the gospel. We are here today because of many people, including Paul, who simply took their abilities and put those abilities in the hands of God. But lastly, I have to share, it is so important to remember our inability and how God's purposes and God's power aren't just 
moving through our abilities, but often through our inabilities as well. Let me end with this. This is, again, the Apostle Paul. Uh, he writes about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Again, this is a man who is captivated with the love of Christ. He, he wants to know the power of Christ in him. He says, it is Christ in me, the hope of glory. And yet, even in the midst of those things, uh, he knows that there's things that, that, he's, that he's faced, certain hardships, certain things that have been so discouraging. In fact, these are two sections. This is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and then 2 Corinthians 12. He says this. He says, these are the things that I've faced as a follower of Jesus. I've been imprisoned. I've experienced countless floggings. I've often been near death. Five times I have received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I received a stoning. Three times I have been shipwrecked. For a night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from bandits, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers and sisters, in toil and hardship through many a sleepless night, hungry and thirsty, often without food, cold and naked. And besides other things, I am under daily pressure because of my anxiety for all the churches. Who is weak? And I am not weak. Who is made to stumble? And I am not indignant. If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. To paraphrase, if I'm going to boast in anything, I'm not going to boast in my abilities. I'm going to boast in my inabilities. The God and Father, Lord Jesus, blessed be he forever, knows that I do not lie. In Damascus, the governor under King Aretas guarded the city of Damascus in order to seize me, but I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped from his hands. And then he goes into verse, or chapter, verse 1 of chapter 12. He goes on. He says, it is, it is necessary to boast, nothing is to be gained by it, but I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. And in verse 8, three times I appealed to the Lord about this, that it would leave me this thorn in the flesh. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. To paraphrase, God's power is made perfect in your inabilities as well. So then he goes on, so I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ, for whenever I am weak, then I am strong. What a great reminder. And I have to include this, that while God can use and wants to use our abilities, that it's not just our abilities that God can use, that God can actually move powerfully in our inabilities as well. So these three things, just to summarize, a reminder, you have abilities and it's a complexity of things in your life that have given you those abilities. Some of them are God-given. They're unique to your family of origin, your experiences, your education. The more that you can take an inventory of your abilities, and sometimes it actually, it requires people in your life. It requires relationships who can be like a mirror, who can speak back to you things in your life that you can't see in your own life. You know, I've had in my life people who have encouraged me who've been such a blessing, who can see something in me that I can't see in myself. We all have blind spots. And I think that we have a blind spot to our weaknesses, but we also have a blind spot to our, our strengths, our abilities. And so if you're not in community, more specifically, if you're not in Christ-centered community, we want to get you connected. In fact, in this shape season, we actually will be moving into our season of Lent and every year, what we do is we get people into Lent life groups. And it's such a great opportunity for you, if you're not in Christ-centered community, to, to test drive, to experience for a short season what it's like to be in Christ-centered community. Of course, these life groups will uh, not only meet in person on our physical campus or in homes throughout Los Angeles, but we're looking for people who would host wherever you live. And so we know we have many people who join us outside of California. 
many people who join us outside the United States. And if you're interested in hosting a Lent life group in your home, at a coffee shop, maybe where you work, reach out to us. If you were to go to belair.org forward slash life groups, all the contact information is there. We can resource you to be able to facilitate a life group. Maybe you're going to invite your friends, your neighbors, people who you know, maybe you're curious about Christianity, people who you know are strong believers. Maybe it's people you work with, whoever it might be. What an opportunity for you to use perhaps your ability to, to connect people, to host, to facilitate conversation. What a great opportunity to take your abilities and to put them into God's hands. But also we have digital life groups as well. We'd love for you. Again, if you go to beller.org forward slash life groups, it's an opportunity to, to look for opportunities to register to join life groups. We're launching these right in February as we get into this Lent life season and we're looking for leaders, facilitators, and people to join those groups as well. But again, that helps you recognize, among many things, your abilities. But second, when you take those abilities and you put them into God's hands, when you take whatever your ability to not just build your name, but to lift up the name of Christ, when it's not just to build your resume, but to actually advance God's heart for others in this world, when you take your abilities and say, okay, God, how can I use this gift, this ability, this education, this experience, this skill for you? When you begin to pray that prayer, God will do miraculous things. At the same level of miracle of feeding the multitudes, God wants to do a miracle through you in the lives of others. Simply take those abilities and put them into God's hands. And then finally, remember, it's not just our abilities, it's our inabilities as well. And it's so important that this all is grounded in a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. You hear the Apostle Paul, what a confident, sure of himself person who through the power of the Holy Spirit came to such a level of maturity that he didn't lose his abilities, but his humility and his groundedness was in who God says he was. He wanted to cultivate that relationship with God far above anything else. And out of the overflow of that relationship, God used his abilities in such powerful ways. I love how Pastor Tim Keller with a turn of the phrase gives, I think, one of the best definitions of humility. He says, you know, humility isn't thinking less of yourself, but humility is thinking of yourself less. You see, there's this false sense of humility that just puts ourselves down. Thinks, oh, I've got, I've got, I've got, you know, I've got no gifts, I've got no skills, and we wrongly attribute that to humility. And I think that's one of the reasons why the church is so unhealthy, why the church as a whole is so out of shape. It's because we don't know how to properly identify the abilities in our life in a way where we think just of ourselves less, but we think about other people and how we can meet their needs, how we can advance ministry, how we can be part of healing and hope and relationships, not only in this community, but on this city and in this world. And when you can begin to use your abilities and say, God, use these abilities, but even in my inabilities, use me in powerful ways. Watch what can happen in your life. Friends, I'm so excited. I hope, I hope you can tell that. There, there's just so much that God has for us in the season ahead. And I've seen it in people's lives when they step forward and say, okay, I want to grow. I want to get in shape. And again, as we move through each of these things from spiritual gifts to last week, our hearts, to this week, our abilities. Remember, next week, we get into personality. And then finally, our experiences. God uses all these unique things in such a powerful way through the life of a local church. I want you to experience this now and forever. So may God bless you. Let's spend some time in prayer. Loving God, we thank you so much that we get just a little taste of your heart for us, your vision for us, of how we might be used in powerful ways, like that little child on that hillside when the multitudes were hungry, like the Apostle Paul, whose life was turned upside down, God, would we be able to take our abilities that you've given us, that we've grown, that we've cultivated, that we've honed in our life, we've put them in your hands. 
And even in all of our inabilities, God, would you move in such a powerful way that it would be your strength in our weaknesses, your strength and your power in our inabilities, so that people ultimately would say, God, you are real. You are majestic. You are powerful. And they don't see our good deeds and praise us, but they see our good deeds and praise you, our Father in heaven. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for your love. And it's in your name we pray. We say together, amen. You know, some interesting information that not everybody knows that we share within our leadership groups is that 95% of people who join our worship services every single week do so online or on television. A remarkable thing that you are a part of. Our ministry that God has given us over the course of 60 years has had to adapt and change in a variety of ways. And we're in this season right now where we serve people not only on our physical campus, but equip them and gather with them in worship no matter where they live. Some of you that's here in Los Angeles, some of you that's somewhere else in our nation, some of you are one of the residents of across 191 countries that are now part of the Bel Air Church worshiping experience. And I wanna invite you to consider yourself part of this church family. We'd love for you to consider membership. We'd love for you to consider getting invested in more ways. And also, I'd like to invite you to give your time, your talent, and your treasure as part of the church family. No matter who you are, no matter where you've been, it's an opportunity to partner with God with what God is doing in this city and around the globe. So would you go to belair.org forward slash give. You can give towards our general fund to extend more and more ministry into the city and around the globe, but also you can choose a drop-down menu that enables you to pay and support us specifically in our KCOP broadcast television ministry. However you choose to give, it's an opportunity for you to lean into this life that God invites you into. God longs for you to simply give back to what God is doing because God first gave to you. So as you give, be blessed. Do so with generous hearts and do so with gratitude and joy that God is gonna multiply your gift exponentially for God's kingdom purposes. Again, thank you and may God bless you on this day. Say
Well, I hope you're encouraged by this hour of worship. And before we wrap up, a reminder, if you go to belair.org forward slash shape, you take that spiritual gift inventory, find out all the ways in which you can grow and get in shape in this season together. And I want you to stick with us for the sermon series as we go through the acronym of SHAPE. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. You won't miss a thing. Follow us on social media. See all the things that God is doing in the life of this church that you get to be a part of. Because we want to follow Jesus, not just today, but every day and everywhere with everyone. May God bless you and may you go in peace.